Uh, good morning to all participants from uh, myself and Katarina. Uh, my name is uh, Ivry Desnos and I work for ESA in the data application division. Yes, uh, good morning uh, indeed. Welcome to this race uh, side event. Uh, my name is Katarina Bams. I work for the Commission in the Earth Observation Unit uh, in the DG called Defense Industry and, Sp and Space. So we're doing the welcome work today, Yves Louis and myself. So Yves Louis, can you enlighten us a bit about the RACE initiative? What does RACE stand for and uh, when was it launched? Okay, RACE uh, stands for uh, Rapid Action on COVID-19 Earth Observation. Uh, it's an initiative which was launched in spring 2020 uh, by the European Space Agency and the European Commission. Okay, that's a good to start. <laughs> Tell us a bit more. Does it use Earth observation data? I already know the answer, but <laughs> yes, of is it publicly available? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, of course. It, its objective is to use Earth observation data to um, monitor and understand the impact of the pandemic on mm -hmm. society, but also on the economy and environment. Okay. Um, it's uh, all the outcome of the work and investigation are presented on the publicly available race dashboard mm -hmm. at race.isa.int, which is a kind of interactive platform where you can really uh, uh, play with the data and uh, retrieve information derived from uh, mainly the Copernicus Sentinel, but also mm -hmm. third party missions and uh, other open data sources. Uh, today, the project includes contribution from uh, over 40 companies and institutions. And we have reached uh, uh, a number of 128 countries globally and is still growing. Okay, thanks. Um, but if I understand correctly, it also uses information products from our Copernicus services. Of course, it uh, also serves as a demonstrator of the complementarity between uh, satellite Earth observation, mm -hmm. modeling, the in inclusion of several products from the Copernicus services, uh, also open source data and various uh, uh, other kind of data such as mobility, mobile information, and, and of course we we are using analytics technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the race initiative started in 2020. What are the plans to continue once the pandemic is over? Uh, will it transform into a new project? Yes, uh, the, the plan is actually to to continue. We we are building on this technology, so we have seen that we can deliver a, a lot of indicators for the economy and the evolution of the environment. And actually the sister dashboard, which we have developed also jointly with uh, NASA and JAXA, uh, is going towards uh, monitoring the environment and looking at some of the climate effects on, on society. Excellent, okay. Tell me uh, about the link uh, or is there a collaboration with scientific, the science community? I'm yes, sure from, the, <laughs> from the outset, there is a strong connection to the science community. Actually, they are guiding us on, uh, on how to use properly the data and, and state-of-the-art algorithm. So this is really um, one key feature, a, a strong science component and, uh, and getting recommendation from these scientific groups. A second component is really the engagement of the public, which we have done through uh, a series of uh, what we call uh, a competition or our, uh, contest, we call them in, in, in the race environment. So these uh, competitions participants uh, are invited to use the open data mm -hmm. and some computer, computational resources provided uh, via the Eurodata Cube. And they can process the data and deliver innovative solution. And actually two of the uh, most innovative solutions derived by, by the public will be presented today. Okay, excellent. Um, talking about today, we don't have a lot of time, so let's quickly quickly race through the agenda. Um, I see these are very short presentations, so that's light. We always like that, I think, um, to be concise. The first agenda item I see, it's a presentation on the race dashboard project. Um, so it will be a demonstration uh, what race can do. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. The next presentation then will deal with the uh, Eurodata Cube, which uh, I, I think uh, I could stress how important it is because the data are ready to be uh, analyzed and processed and organized in a, in a cube fashion. Okay, and the next agenda item, what will be presented under the showcasing newest indicators? 
as I was mentioning, we have a growing uh, contribution from industry and we are going to show some of the newest indicators okay. uh, on, on uh, oil, agriculture, environment uh, regarding air and water quality. Excellent. Then we will jump into the world of the Copernicus services, I see. There will be a presentation from our Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service and from the Marine Environment Monitoring Service. Yes, so we will also follow by the race challenge and the uh, European Data Cube workspace for the challenge. And there will be two presentations, uh, one by uh, by ESA about the contest approach and the second by industry on, on the use of the EDC. Okay. Last but not least, can you tell me then what will be dealt with in agenda item nine? So nine is about uh, public contribution to to the dashboard, okay. and it's about for truck and the flying airplane and vessel detections. All right, and then there will be a brief Q and A. I understand if there are questions all over these presentations. And so, I don't know if Louis, I think, thank you very much for the brief explanation. Eh? So I would say, let's not keep the public and the speakers waiting any longer. Uh, both if Louis and myself, we wish you a very fruitful session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Then I will just uh, jump in and share my screen. I hope that you can see it well. Perfect. Okay, so great. Uh, so my name is Anka Angela. I am um, leading the technical development of this dashboard. So I will just make a very short um, review, let's say, of what this project is about and just give a very, very short demo. Uh, not to repeat what was already said uh, by Yves Louis and Katarina. So this, um, this project is called Rapid Action on COVID-19 and Earth Observation. It's basically um, a project where we try to demonstrate what we can achieve with Earth observations in terms of um, looking at the impact of the pandemic. And um, what I would like to stress on this slide is actually the thing that I've highlighted here in yellow, so the, the link to the GitHub, uh, because the main message that I would like to, to transmit in, in this short presentation is that this is a collaborative project. So this is an open source project. We invite um, contributions through the various um, activities that we launch with the competitions, with the challenges, um, but also directly from, from the dashboard itself. Um, we have included the a possibility, so we have a feedback button there that takes you directly to GitHub. And uh, we, we would really like to see um, this project used and reused, let's say. Uh, so I will just jump to the next slide. Um, the, just to, to point out the, the main idea that was um, behind the project. So we were um, aiming to um, make use of the whole range of um, Earth observations that we have available, mostly from Copernicus services, uh, from Copernicus uh, Sentinels, uh, also using Copernicus services data, and to transform this information into um, something that can be very easy to understand by the general public. Uh, so um, let's say we made a translation from from the Earth observations and the satellite information into something that is, um, let's say, in the language of the, of the citizen. Uh, so this dashboard that we developed includes a wide range of indicators from um, economy to environment uh, and health as well. And it's all presented in a very interactive um, way, uh, also linking to the Earth observations um, that stand behind those um, information. So we have a large number of companies that have contributed their um, shown here on this slide. Um, I will just play a very short, uh, sh very short video just to showcase the, uh, the interface. So there is this central map panel um, where you can see all these pins where we have um, locations with data and uh, the countries that we cover. It's basically the whole of Europe and the number of indicators that are either um, presented on a per um, spot um, basis or global indicators, basically maps data. Uh, so all the, um, the list of indicators is accessible from the interface and you can just go to each location and look what, what data is available there. Um, inspect the graphs, um, interact with the graphs, but also look at the Earth observation data that is behind. Uh, so for some of the indicators, we use machine learning, such as this one where we have object detection. 
uh, but you will see a lot of, of a lot of this in the coming presentation. So I will not um, insist too much on this. Uh, what I would like to stress is that the, the project is based on a lot of open data. So um, the most um, used data in the project comes from the Copernicus Sentinels. We have all the Sentinels, or almost all of them, um, that are flying, providing data for this dashboard. Um, we have also contributions from the Copernicus services, uh, as well as statistics data, health data, um, population density, mobile analytics, AIS, and so forth. Uh, just to uh, remind that we have two uh, community contributions uh, that will be shown today. So one is on the truck detection and one is on uh, moving uh, airplanes. Uh, they both exploit the same very uh, cool artifact in the Sentinel-2 imagery and you will hear uh, a lot about it. This is just to point out um, that, again, that this is a collaborative project and this uh, en en enables me to um, introduce the last point that I would like to, to make and the last demo that I would like to show, uh, which is on this um, feature that we recently released. It's called the Custom Dashboard, and I will just uh, play this video and speak on it. So here we have um, uh, introduced the possibility for uh, participants to, sorry, for users to um, add um, indicators to a custom view. So included this little button there that was called um, Add to Custom Dashboard. And once you add these indicators to a view, you can just interact with the elements, um, move them around, um, um, zoom into the places where you want to inspect, uh, and also um, go back to the dashboard and add some more um, as you want to, to customize the dashboard. So in this example, I was focusing on Italy. So I'm just um, browsing through the dashboard, um, selecting Italy as a country, looking at which indicators are available for this place, and then just adding, um, indica keeping adding indica indicators to this custom view. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do, uh, like uh, customizing the titles of the elements that we want to add, um, and just um, in including um, whatever information we want. Um, there is also the possibility to add customize text and images to this custom view. Uh, and finally, when we are um, happy with the selection of data that we want to add, for example, now uh, we're looking at what could be relevant if we combine air quality data with humidity. Uh, so I'm just browsing to the humidities and seeing that I have some, uh, some CDS data available on Italy and I decided to add it to, uh, to the dashboard uh, uh, also. And if I'm happy, I can just go back to my custom view and then um, customize a bit um, how I want the elements to, um, to look, fix the map position uh, since I'm interested in Italy. Uh, and then maybe I just jump a bit to the end. So when I'm, when I'm happy with, uh, with all the selection that I've done, uh, I can just save this dashboard uh, give it a title as I wish, um, indicate there um, some of the interests that I have, um, give my name and my, and my email address where I will receive finally the, um, the links to uh, be able to go back to this um, custom view and share them uh, maybe with my peers so that we can uh, collaboratively edit on it. So I've copied the, the view link here. And now if I am a team member, I can just go back to this URL and um, have access to exactly the same view that my teammate made and inspect the same locations uh, as before. So this is uh, what I wanted to show. Uh, you will hear a lot more about this uh, in the coming presentations. Thank you very much for, for listening to my talk and um, we're here for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anka. So I take over, is that correct? Yes, uh, so next presentation is from Synergize. Greg up. Perfect. Thanks. Just to start the screen. Can you confirm that you see my screen? 
pequeñas. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Anka, Ivory, and everyone else at the call. So I'm Greg Minchinski. I'm coming from Synergize, and I'll quickly drive you through the Eurodata Cube platform, which is providing the technical support to the uh, the whole race initiative, actually. So when we were uh, starting the Eurodata Cube uh, um, project uh, a few years ago, what our main objective was to basically make the EO data used to the uh, capacity that it should be used, right? Because we believe that, or we, we noticed that it's significantly underutilized based on how valuable it is. And to do that, we knew that we first need to get the data available to anyone just to get familiar with it so that they can really explore and understand it. Then to create tools that allow them to build on the ideas that they have to analyze, to create algorithms and so on. And then uh, in order to, to, to be able to create applications so that they can uh, then uh, provide the information that they extract from the data to, to others who are maybe not uh, as, uh, as, savvy, as technically savvy in terms of their observation. So um, in a nutshell, what the Eurodata Cube is now is a set of applications, API libraries, uh, which provide more or less all the functionality needed for the processing of our observation data. I mean, there is not one tool that fits everyone, so we created a several, and then simply the one chooses the those that fit them best. The idea is that I, you go to the Jupyter notebook, you create a prototype there, but you are also able to scale up this on the large uh, to the global scale if needed. You can do it in uh, on on your laptop or in your favorite cloud environment or within the Eurodata Cube itself, and it needs to be really said that your data cube is not like a project, but rather it's a set of operational services, uh, some of them pre-existing, some of them uh, being built within the uh, within this initiative. And they really are there uh, readily uh, uh, used and useful uh, um, and used by many, and therefore they should be used by you as well. Now, uh, what your data cube is, is really a, a, a set of tools all of, which is, all of it is built on the cloud infrastructure, uh, on the several clouds, integrating data coming from Copernicus, USGS, commercial sources uh, everywhere. Um, and then there are tools and services in place which provide access to the data, processing of the data, both raster and vector, right? It's not just a um, satellite. Then we have the um, co uh, hosted compute so that you can run some things directly in the uh, Eurodata Cube, Jupyter Lab. And all of this is available through a set of APIs, uh, both the standard ones like OGC, but also the Python dedicated APIs simply because the Python is most commonly used uh, language in the earth observation domain. So you can really uh, do most of it. Now, it all starts and ends with the data and we put a lot of effort to make as much data available as possible. At the moment, it's more than 50 petabytes um, uh, going for all the, set, uh, the, the, all the open missions such as Sentinel, Landsat, Modis and the like, as well as integration with the commercial satellites, Airbus, Maxar, Planetscope but not just satellite data, also derived products like Copernicus services, uh, and as well as the I know, administrative data from, uh, from the, the national uh, organizations. And we put a proactive effort to um, expand this portfolio to get more collections in, uh, and to make sure that the data are always up to date, right? So it's not just support for this data, but uh, for, uh, for all of this, you can get access to full and global archives. Uh, and this is why it's like really 50 petabytes of data. Now, that being said, as much as we try, we cannot make sure that each and every collection will be there, which is why we have the capability to bring your own data, where you simply uh, uh, get your data in one of the supported formats, you put it on the object storage in one of the supported clouds, and then uh, ingest it in the Eurodata cube, and as, then you can do everything uh, um, uh, with it as, as, as well as with the other uh, missions. Uh, then, in terms of the services, uh, you have Sentinel Hub for instant access to the um, Earth observation and other raster data. It's super easy to integrate in workflows and applications. Uh, you have Xcube uh, library uh, to provide extension into the, uh, the the wide Python portfolio of tools and open source libraries, so that you can really get uh, as much as possible out of it. Um, you have GeoDB because, as mentioned, it's not just about raster data. Lots of the useful and essential data is in vector format, and we have GeoDB where you can store and process and access this, uh, the vector data as well. Some are uh, open collections, some are simply there to, uh, to onboard by yourself. 
Statistical API provides super efficient way uh, into long time series, uh, so that if you need a couple of years of data over a specific object, rather than working with pixel, you just get the statistics out of it. Uh, if you want to do something large scale, or if you want to create the uh, features for the machine learning process, there is batch processing where you simply define how you would like to have features configured, interpolated, harmonized, and uh, what else. And then you say, look, I'd like to have this over this region, can be globe, uh, and then have it running. And you, in, in a couple of hours, you'll have everything readily available. Uh, there is hosted compute uh, powered by EXR workspace uh, where you get access to the actual virtual machines, uh, both CPU and GPU powered so that you can run some processes directly there. There is Jupyter, Jupyter Lab uh, um, full of uh, quite useful um, examples in Jupyter notebooks from start to end using machine learning as well as many of the things that will be uh, presenting today or will be presented today by others are available there as uh, examples as well. Now, uh, we have uh, launched this week the Bring Your Own Algorithm capability, and I'll invite everyone to uh, uh, check the recording once it's available, if you haven't participated, which basically allows you to take your algorithm, uh, which within the Eurodata Cube, you made it to work uh, up to the extent that you can actually present it to others, and then you uh, deploy it to the uh, um, Eurodata Cube, and then you can simply make it available to everyone to use. You set your own constraints like, like commercial terms and the pricing and whether it's free or not. Uh, and then you, 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 it's there available for everyone to use and you don't need to bother about that because it's taking over by the Euro data. Um, and the, it was designed in a way that you can then take these algorithms and chain them so that you really build on top of it rather than uh, rebuild the stuff that was already done. Now, um, going back to the objectives, so when we started, we really believed that this, these, these things are essential, uh, and I believe that we came quite far with it, right? So uh, EuroDataCube is powering, for example, your uh, EO browser, which provides like the most easy and, and uh, um, accessible way to get uh, familiar with dirt observation data to tens of thousands of people around the world every month who go and explore what's happening with our planet. Then we have the EDC browser, which is a more professional uh, and uh, um, um, uh, application similar to that, uh, providing access to all the collections that are available in the Eurodata Cube in, again, a similar, uh, yet a bit more uh, featureful environment. And there are already results. I mean, even just these applications uh, provide some useful results, like these scientists who were looking for the penguin poo to identify new colonies in Antarctica, or this guy who used your browser to geolocate the photo of this hairy legs by a lost hiker and send the search and rescue team there, all powered by Earth observation data. Now, um, the, the tools that we made in place to allow exploring and analyzing and building were very nicely demonstrated in the uh, COVID-19 uh, custom script contest, which we run with ESA and I think will be also uh, described in this session. Uh, where people came and were able to, from scratch, build uh, their ideas into something that was really demonstrable. And several of these ideas actually uh, came to the stage that they were fully operational, like track detection, which will as well be shown uh, uh, during this session, and are now deployed as a bring your own algorithm to the Eurodata Cube so that anyone can come and make use of it. Uh, now, last but not least, uh, when we have these algorithms working and the procedures, it's really essential uh, to have applications so that you can extract the relevant information to the people who are, let's say, not bothered about the satellite data at all. They just want to get the information. And this is where I, the race dashboard, I think, is such a nice uh, initiative demonstrating how it could be done, yet also providing the, the, the information directly. It's not the only application. There are hundreds of applications worldwide uh, powered by the uh, Eurodata Cube, and uh, some of them will be described in this session, and I'm looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greta. This was a really, really cool presentation. Um, I welcome now Florian Taller from OILX, who will um, talk to us about one of the economic indicators that were recently added to the dashboard. Yeah, thank you, Anka. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen? We yeah. can, yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. We are excited to present today um, an index, uh, European crude oil storage indicator. It's an economic indicator to measure what happened to the energy supply chains 
during COVID, but interestingly, it also has its validity right now for those that follow the news, what happens to the energy supply chains. Um, what, just a brief note where how we approach the, the angle of uh, leveraging Earth observation or, or how we call it increasingly Earth intelligence. It's really sits in the middle. We are a data fusion company that combines maritime offshore data with onshore geospatial data uh, and combines it with national statistics in order to create new insights and deliver them through a software as a service to clients. Um, with that approach, we have created a European crude oil storage index, which in cooperation with Aresis, a spin-off from the Politecnico in Milan, which is a, a composite, composite uh, indicator that is combining uh, a bunch of different things, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, AIS as well, uh, maritime movements of cargoes, uh, crude oil tankers in particular, and also the University of Oxford's COVID tracker to understand whether there were severe lockdowns or, or mild lockdowns happening in different countries or regions. We use, how do we do it? How do we generate the index? We use the Sentinel-2 uh, to detect and find uh, locate storage tanks in Europe. We do it globally, but in particular for this index in Europe. And then to leverage the Sentinel-1 data and interferometric uh, techniques uh, to understand the uh, movements of the uh, floating roofs. Uh, these will allow us to understand also what the changes are at, at dedicated ports in, in, in Europe. What did we do is we created index measures. Uh, Europe is surrounded by a key of logistical ports and locations that have um, superior importance um, because they are at choke points, at key points. I would, I would flag Rotterdam being one of the most important ones where a lot of uh, commodities arrive and then get redistributed within Europe. So monitoring that will tell you a lot of what's going on. I think the origins of this index are going back to the commodity trading sector that has been using for ages the metric of inventories because they tell you in one number uh, the health or the status of the market and whether it is um, important or not. I would like to stress that uh, while this index was created for COVID purposes, actually here and right now, uh, it's also telling you how we go out of it, how the economy is improving. And I think we definitely advocate to keep uh, the index on because it will allow you to monitor things even way beyond uh, COVID times. Just a, a technical aspect here. You can see the human eye is relatively good in the sense that you can see the floating roof tanks. These are crude oil tanks. Some of them are full, some of them are empty, some of them are half full. But if you have to do this at scale and every week, then I think it requires a more an automated approach. So uh, Sentinel-2 um, Sentinel helps us to locate them. But then ultimately, I'll show you here an example, we also look at the cylinder, the diameter, but also the displacement of the roofs, how they move up and down. And I think that's, that's one way to monitor uh, these locations, the inventories. Now, how do the Sentinel see the tank? You see here uh, the example of, of uh, Rotterdam. Um, Rotterdam on the, on the right hand side here is uh, on the 702 image. You can see it, it's a bit blurry, but it's very important for us because you can see we can monitor which tanks are in, in operational and which are not. Most of them are painted white uh, uh, for, uh, to avoid the heat. Uh, some of them are rusty, unfortunately, uh, but uh, a vast majority is white and that allows us to locate them. And then we use the Sentinel to monitor the high displacement. Um, it's important that uh, you get a quick uh, map from, my, from me to understand how important certain locations are in, in Europe on the ports. So you can see here, that's the oil infrastructure, courtesy of the International Energy Agency in Paris, that shows you that uh, there's a full web of pipelines and st storage and refineries across Europe that helps us that we can still have access to energy, um, oil in particular, and that the resupply works efficiently. This has grown for over 50, 60 years, and uh, is now in, a, in, a, in a getting stress tested right now at the moment. What we do is we overlay that with monitoring a bunch of different sites across all of Europe, and uh, those are not, uh, they are chosen carefully. They are at the neurologic point of the system, and they need to be monitored carefully for, for, to understand the, the health of the market. So going back on the indicator, you can go to the uh, race dashboard. You will find a crude oil storage index here. 
And uh, I chose here as a, an example Rotterdam because it beautifully shows how in, with the, when you overlay also the Oxford data on the lockdown restrictions, you can see that we went into the market um, and the stocks kept on building. Why is that? All of a sudden during COVID, demand was falling away, but the oil kept on coming. And then all of a sudden you have stocks building up at the ports because the demand is not there. Most, most recently, however, we see a flip side of that, that actually the, the demand has been recovering. We go out of lockdowns and all of a sudden you have a, a, a relatively fast uh, reconnection and we are back now to pre-COVID levels in, in the port of Rotterdam. And actually you could, you could argue not as bad as it is on the gas market, but energy supply uh, storage gets a bit constrained, oil as well alongside gas. A second one is the German port of Wilhelmshaven in the north, which resupplies a lot of Western Germany, German refineries, the BP and Shell refineries. And you can see similar patterns that we had during COVID restrictions, demand was falling away, stocks were building. But right now we observe an indicator that you can all access on the race dashboard that we go back to levels that we have seen before. And now the question that I have is really, and what we are following every day now is what's happening now? Are we going even lower than that? And um, and how what's what's uh, what's here in uh, in what should we expect for the the winter the winter months to come? Do we have enough energy in inventories in order to get us through the winter? That's all from storage index. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Happy to take any questions online, offline, and uh, with that, I'm happy to pass back to Anka. Thank you so much, Florian. This was very very interesting. And uh, very, very timely with the, <laughs> with the gas crisis that is ongoing. Um, so I will pass the poll now to Isabella Kausch from Vista. Uh, she will talk to us about the latest agriculture indicator that was added to the dashboard. Okay, thank you for introducing. Um... Okay, so I hope you see my presentation. And um, we are uh, working um, within the project COVID Harvest and uh, showing our results on the race platform and on two uh, platforms even more. Um, COVID Harvest, <coughs> uh, I'm um, working at Vista as a software developer and uh, Vista um, is funded in 1995 uh, in Munich. And at the moment, we are uh, 22 employees and um, from research and development activities, um, we uh, developed um, many operational services. Um, they are divided in two main segments, um, the hydrology and the agriculture. And uh, we um, have services like uh, yield forecasts or precision farming. And within the hydrology, uh, we monitor snow and um, make runoff forecasts um, and so on. And um, within COVID harvest, we analyze the impacts of COVID-19 on agriculture um, by deriving harvest dates and patterns um, using Sentinel-1 data. And um, it built on the extensive big data analysis framework um, of Y and added SAR analysis to it. Um, y, I will explain um, then in the next slides later. Um, but first of all, um, what was the study area? Of course, Europe, um, it was 19, uh, was in 19 countries and uh, we selected about 200,000 points of interest. Um, we looked at the vegetation period of last year and we analyzed the crop types, winter cereals, winter rapeseed and summer crops. And we derived harvest dates with an accuracy of three to six days, um, depending on the number of available orbits from Sentinel-1. Um, if we look at um, some backscatter images um, from Sentinel-1, then um, we have the VH and the VV acquisition and the um, ratio VH-VV. And um, these three parameters are uh, visualized as RGB composites here. And in the ideal case, um, the, 
VV, the green um, band, will increase after harvest, but the red and the blue will decrease. So um, we want to see the harvest, but um, as you can see in the images here, um, it's not that easy to just um, find that out from backscatter. So what we do is we look at the um, coherence um, and the workflow um, is visualized here. So if we have ma maize plants on the field, for example, and we have um, two acquisition dates, date one and date two, then uh, the coherence is low. Um, after day two, we have a harvest event, um, but the coherence um, stays low um, at all between day two and day three. Um, but only with day four, um, if the uh, after harvest, there is a high coherence because these stable ground conditions after harvest um, will increase the coherence significantly. Um, and this is visualized here in a time series of the coherence in the top graph. And um, at the vegetation time from uh, July to October, um, the coherence stays uh, very low, but after a harvest event or maybe a tillage methods, um, the um, coherence increases significantly. Um, but this is not enough. We we uh, use also the sigma naught ratio VHVV to detect a harvest event. And um, if we look at the time series, the um, uh, sigma naught will decrease um, after harvest took take place uh, took place. So um, we combine these two parameters. Um, <clears throat> Then we run the algorithm for all our 200 POEs in uh, Europe and um, get as result for um, the winter cereals um, this map. And um, it's pretty nice to see that we have a, a very um, a, a great south-north gradient. Um, so in the south, winter cereals are harvested uh, much earlier than in the north. And this uh, makes sense and is as, as expected due to the climatic um, conditions. So since the harvest dates have been calculated, um, they have to be examined in more detail due to COVID-19. And that's um, when Y comes in. Um, um, so for this, we relate the calculated harvest dates from our algorithm with our Y service chain. Y is a yield prediction service chain and it calculates the harvest progress according to nat natural factors um, by the use of the physically based crop growth modeling. Thus, the model predicts a harvest date that takes into account many measured variables and current information, such as satellite data, mainly Sentinel-2 data, weather data, information about the maturity stage of the plant, and soil conditions and topography. Um, so in Y, we um, derive the expected harvest progress curve, um, here visualized in black, um, which describes the perfect time of harvest of the plant in a significant region. And um, what we can say now is that if the harvest date derived um, from radar is earlier than predicted uh, with Y, then the plant um, was harvested green. And that's typical for silage corn or silage wheat. But on the other hand, if the harvest date derived from radar is later than predicted with Y, then this could be a temporal delay caused by COVID-19. And this comparison was done for all 19 European countries and all uh, three crop type groups. And the result um, is, as we see here, exemplarily for uh, winter cereals again, um, that Mainly all countries are uh, congruent with Y, but um, Hungary, Spain, and the UK show some um, delayed harvest. 
um, it's the percentage of delayed harvest at end season. Um, but in the end, um, after uh, we did an extensive research on COVID-19 cases and uh, uh, the, restric the restrictions in these countries, um, we can't reveal a clear uh, COVID-19 impact. And in the end, um, of course, we published um, all our data on the race platform. That's why I'm talking here. But we also um, published our data on the food security tab, um, where um, a user can also download the data um, with the special harvest age dates for all um, POIs. And we also have a commercial platform uh, within our um, Ypsilon uh, project, and um, there we also um, uh, published our uh, results. And maybe I can switch there quickly. Can you see the website? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, Here's always a small um, description um, and it's an interactive website where we can um, click uh, on a country. Um, you can on the uh, right panel um, select which crop type um, you want to see or investigate. And um, you have also the selection between the country level um, so this is a bit uh, <clears throat> uh, smaller, and then we ha you have also the regional level where you can see all the single regions uh, where we had um, our points of interest. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Also, if you have questions, um, let me know. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Isabella. So we reviewed some of the economic indicators, some agriculture ones, and now we move to the environmental indicators. So I would like to um, call my colleague, Christian Richard. Hello. Yes, we can see your screen. Welcome, Chris. Yes, I'm trying to share. For some reason, the audio is very low on my end. We can hear you very well. So. Okay, very good. It's it's back. Okay, all right. Um, happy to speak uh, on this occasion. My name is Christian Dretscher. I'm working in Esrin. I'm the atmosphere scientist, and I will um, cover a couple of slides on the air quality um, activity related to uh, the race dashboard and the challenges. So let's just dive into the matter. What are we talking about? Air quality parameters, primarily with taken air quality parameters um, supplied by Copernicus Sentinel 5P mission, and that is a nitrogen dioxide, NO2, and also carbon monoxide, CO. So what is that, how it's being produced? I mean, there's, there was lots of that in the media, of course, probably more on the NO2 than on the on CO. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is typically being produced um, by combustion, um, of fossil fuels, but also in, in general, a combustion process. So that relates, of course, to traffic, to industry, um, energy production, of course. So when you would just burn uh, coal, for instance, to, uh, to create uh, electric, uh, electricity, but also heating. Um, NO2 has a rather short lifetime of about four hours, and it's been diluted let's say in the atmosphere by either transport, so it's been blown away by the wind, or, or chemistry, so it's been transformed to something else like uh, ground level ozone. Um, why do we actually care about NO2? Um, NO2 is harmful um, to our lungs. So when you inhale a high dose of NO2, that's, that is not good for you. You're not immediately dying from it, um, but in the long run, let's say 20 years or so, um, there is clear statistical data, medical data that proves that inhaling large dose of NO2 over that many years is, is harmful. Um, 
what limits the capabilities of measuring NO2 from space? I mean, uh, remember the satellite flies at an altitude of about 800 kilometers and the amount of NO2 that we are trying to observe is in the under 1% range. It's actually much, much smaller than that, but just to keep this, uh, keep that in mind. So it's a very, very tiny um, chemical species that we're trying to observe. Whenever there's a cloud coming in the way, um, we cannot see NO2. Um, there's also meteorological effects um, that basically transports it away or, or let's say it, it washes out of the atmosphere. So there's lots of, lots of dynamics also going on with this, with this NO2. Um, I only mentioned that. So the, the satellite flies over once per day and gets a daily total column. So basically the whole amount of NO2 that's been seen from the satellite down to the surface is being recorded and that's quite a big change a big difference to when people talk about surface concentration so that's the surface concentration is actually the one that you inhale this is at the critical part the sensitive spectral range for for no2 is between 400 let's say in, in the 400 nanometer range so it's visible so on a very polluted day you actually see like a brownish layer of no2 in the atmosphere so you can actually see that what we have produced for race, and I will then later visualize that, is to account for all these things I just mentioned, is 14-day running averages. Um, and that's basically to smear out all these effects, you know, of cloud cover, wind, precipitation, all of that. The second uh, product that I'll be um, showing later is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is, of course, known to be quite a deadly um, chemical species if you inhale a large dose of it. Uh, but what we're seeing from the satellite, of course, is again, the total column. So um, carbon monoxide is, understanding, is, is, is important to understand troposphere chemistry. It's also been produced uh, by burning fossil fuels, but also biomass burning. So it's quite a, quite a sign for biomass burning whenever you see CO popping up. But it also contributes to oxidation of methane um, or is involved in the oxidation of methane and other hydrocarbons. Different to NO2, CO has a much longer lifetime, about weeks and months. So we're doing three-day averages because CO is, is rather is rather stable from one day, from one day to the other. The spectral band that we're looking at is two to three micrometers, so that's so-called shortwave infrared. You cannot see CO no, compared to NO2. Uh, let's just quickly. Uh, Talk you to some um, of these um, visualizations here. So this is an image you have probably seen all over the place in news, in media, on TV, and so on. These are the typical changes in NO2 from 2019 to 2020, highlighting a couple of cities um, with, uh, let's say, because of the lockdown uh, measures, um, people were driving less cars, uh, industry has produced less NO2 and so on. So the numbers are quite dramatic, but there is quite a large um, error on that. So for Madrid, Paris, Po Valley, Rome, we are in the 50% range of reduction if you take if you take an average over months. But again, it's 15% of uncertainty, and that again relates to what I said before: precipitation, cloud cover, wind, chemistry. So there's there's many things that actually dilute dilute the signal or giving giving precise numbers. But what you can see, the change. Um, of NO2 emission is 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 visible. Huh? Um, when it comes to the race uh, dashboard, um, how did we visualize all of that? So be, because all these NO2 images are being processed offline, then pulled over to the race dashboard. You see in the in the large in the large plot on this on this slide, you see the NO2 on the on the top right, and you see this little slider, so you can select to daytime ranges um, where the NO2 is being mapped and you can slide left and right and you see how this how how the change is actually happening now. If you click on one of these cities in the center, and then much of that has been talked uh, by the speakers before me, if you click on one of these buttons in the center, then pops out a so-called time series. So basically for all these cities that you see there, um, we've produced a time series from 2018, so whenever S5P data was available up to now, um, basically following, let's say, daily and then averaged um, over these daily 14-month 
uh, 14 week, 14 day, I'm sorry, running averages of, of NO2, of NO2 pollution. These pink bars, they um, show the lockdown. So whenever there's a lockdown, you see, you see quite a dip, quite a dip in this NO2. Um, coming to one of these challenges that we were running, um, there was one recent one that's been closed already and how does the pandemic affect shipping traffic and related air and water quality. And the objective there was to develop in integrated ways to characterize shipping vessel dynamics. Of course, we know ships also produce a lot of NO2. If there's less ship traffic, then of course, you see, you see, you see that as a signal. Um, relevant to that is also if the harbor is sitting next to a large city, you have to basically disentangle the, uh, the signals coming from the city, from the car traffic, from the industry on land versus what is happening on the harbors. And it was this one idea of the winner, Alessandro Cimbelli, who developed a Sentinel-1 based indicator count on anchored vessels and, and correlated that with Sentinel-5P data. Um, coming to the next uh, slide, basically illustrating some of that. So NO2 levels, uh, boat traffic. Um, I mean, you can all go to the to the web page and basically click you through. You also see some kind of a of it's not really a time series, a histogram. No, over a couple of over a couple of months, where you see how the total traffic versus the so-called scaled NO2 is actually behaving. Um, Next is our carbon monoxide. So remember what I said, carbon monoxide is a rather, let's say, slowly changing chemical species. Uh, when you look on the left on the plot, um, the high levels of CO, um, the reddish and orange color um, are in the biomass burning areas. Uh, so there's Africa, there's also India popping up, um, some, some signals over China. What you can't properly see in this plot is like the world, the world map, which is on the bottom on the bottom right. Uh, it, it just didn't fit the screen here, so, so you see apparently a lot of a lot of um, CO production over over Asia. Uh, where is all this data coming from? Uh, it's been processed by a service called Sentinel Five P PAL, the mapping service. When you go to PAL now, uh, you see the link on the bottom on the bottom right. Uh, you can see NO two CO. Uh, this data is available uh, um, for over a year now, and um, recently there was an SO two added. So sulfur dioxide is yet another is yet another pollutant that we are trying to monitor. That is not on race yet, but this is on the on the mapping service. And a final slide, quite a busy one. I'm sorry, is related to this race activity. We were running a study in parallel that was called ECOVAC. And the reason for ECOWAC is to also look into other species that are not so prominent, uh, like NO2 or also CO. Um, so I just mentioned SO2, SO2 reductions, for instance, over northern China, 75%, so quite dramatic. Um, formaldehyde reductions, 40%, glyoxyl reductions, 50% uh, around um, February time. Um, the same is similar numbers are true for India. But one real reason to run that study is also to prove if or not there was a change in so-called XCO2. So XCO2 um, is, is uh, CO2, of course, is, is the one climate gas no, that, uh, that uh, many people are focusing on. And the question is, is the reduction of um, combustion, you know, is that changing the CO2 signal? Because CO2 is co-emitted, of course, with in every in every burning process, if you want, whenever you create NO2, there's very likely CO2 being produced. But the answer is very simple. Um, the signal is very, very weak because CO2 has such a high background uh, that the additional contribution of CO2 or the, the reduction of CO2 is minimum. So you minimal. So you basically don't see these changes very easily. And there was this one case over China where if you look close, you can see a couple of changes, but but not pretty much. So that's turning into a climate, let's say into um, 
let's say a forward looking forward looking message means shutting down the economy for a number of months doesn't do much to save the planet regarding global warming more needs to be done and my final remarks on this study is so it was a one year it was a yeah a one year study created 19 peer reviewed papers on all these things above um, a number of presentations, press releases, TV coverage, ARD, um, ARD in Germany, BBC, interviews with Greta Thunberg, a MOOC contribution, so massive online open course. So if you want to go, you can click yourself through and you get all the interviews with the with the scientists. And I believe with that, I came to an end. I come to an end. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. This was uh, very informative. Uh, we're staying with uh, in the domain of air quality, and we have with us uh, Stein Vermuda from uh, ECMWF Comes. Uh, welcome, Stein. Thanks for being here today. Can you hear us? Uh, we cannot hear you for some reason, or I cannot. Oh, still not. Stein, we see you, but uh, it looks you are muted on some. Can you see me now and hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, yes, so what I was asking Anka is uh, if you can share my slides. So I uh, can share your slides. Yes, one okay. sec. Let me just load them. All right. My apologies for joining late. Uh, we had the C3S Gala event, which um, overran a little bit. So um, and I just joined to 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 hear uh, to listen to Chris' uh, nice presentation, and I think what we provide in comms is a vice is a very nice compliment. So. Um, uh, Okay, so I should. So just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Stein Vermoten. I'm uh, uh, the head of section for user outreach and engagement at ECMWF, uh, which also includes um, uh, Copernicus, of course, and then the future destination Earth will also be part of, um, of, of my activities. Uh, at least to the extent of user engagement. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk about the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And I think what's nice to see here is how it complements what um, the satellite observations, and of course we, we have Sentinel-5P if we focus on, on Copernicus, what CAMS can provide as an added value. In a way, we see CAMS as a user of, of what ADA provides on this. But what CAMS provides is a, bl is, is a blending of observations, so satellite and non-satellite observations with models to provide a consistent picture. And this is based on the laws of physics and chemistry and advanced mathematical models called data assimilation. And by this, we can, in fact, um, make seamless maps, so because we can, um, in fact, um, produce uh, concentrations for those areas where observations were not possible, but we can also look into the future. We can do forecasts some uh, days ahead, and we also provide reanalysis over the past years and decades. And what we also provide is our concentrations at surface level. And of course, when we talk about um, atmospheric composition and we look at it in scope of health, public health, it's at nose level, which uh, that's the most important. 
So um, these are some elements which I wanted to highlight um, uh, in, in scope of, of my presentation. Next, next slide, please. If you now focus on, on, on COVID-19, and there was a lot of discussion, of course, in, in, in the press, and, and um, in, in, in a way, COVID-19 was a certain, a certain blessing for, for those uh, um, atmosphere monitoring uh, specialists to, to assess what the impact is of a lockdown on emissions and concentrations in, in, in the atmosphere, and to see and approve the added value of Sentinel-5P, but also uh, CAMPS. And here is, an, is a very nice example of, of a private company together with uh, a National Meteorological Service in, from the Netherlands, KNMI, where they use CAMS forecast as a, a background because of the fact that we are generally quite uh, accurate and, and use it as a business as usual for, for their emissions. And by this, they could, in fact, investigate what's the impact of uh, the lockdown um, um, uh, compared compared to a normal situation, so it's it's a very very nice example. Another example is is presented on my next slide, where we supported the European Environmental Agency in their annual air quality report to bring together a lot of sentinel uh, satellites and machine learning methods and multimodal scenario runs to do a consistent uh, evaluation of uh, many different cities on how. Um, uh, in this case, in the picture, and the two levels have been reduced or changed over time, and where sometimes it's there's a clear signal which is not uh, per se linked to to the lockdown, but weather and other factors which also need to be taken into account. So there was a clear need um, to to make sure that CAMS was introduced into the race uh, dashboard. Next slide, please. And um, that's why uh, back in, in autumn last year, um, Anka uh, called me and said, let's, let's do something together. Let's collaborate and let's, let's see how CAMS can be integrated in, in, the, plat, in, the, in the dashboard. And um, what we decided is to integrate service concentrations uh, from CAMS for a couple of key air pollutants. So it's NO2, PM2.5 and 10 at Ozum. Uh, and ozone, and this uh, at global level, and for selection of 50 European uh, cities. Um, and in fact, we, we only had a little time to do this, but it was very effective, um, not only because of, of the professional support at, at ESA, but also because CAMS offers um, uh, the data in a, via a standard interface. So from our side to make sure that all these things were integrated in, in, in the race uh, dashboard didn't take too much effort. And this proved the added value to work with standard interfaces to make these type of things um, uh, possible. So you see on the map where you can find the CAMS air quality data just below air quality uh, data as, as uh, Chris presented. Um, and then uh, maybe we go to the next slide. Um, and, and one of one of the elements which we provide are time series. That's always uh, interesting to see for five large cities in Europe. So, so all the capitals plus uh, a selection of others. Um, and these time series are providing information on how background air uh, pollution has evolved since the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. So we started in February 2020. The values represent areas of 10 by 10 kilometers. Uh, so it's more representing the urban uh, background, so it's not the local uh, uh, air quality levels which we measure, but background data. And then uh, we combine this with information on restrictions on lockdown measures in, uh, measures in place in the country where the city is located, from the University of, of Oxford. And then you see like the, 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 the bars which indicate high restriction, low restrictions. You see the values, which are um, um, the mean daily daily values, the, the seven day mean values, and then also uh, we provide in gray, in fact, um, the background information from the past, from uh, 2017 to 2019, so you can make a comparison. What's nice, and I can't illustrate it here, is that you can zoom into the map and you can drag out it, so you, you, it's, it's really dynamic and it's very nicely made. Um, to, 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 to provide uh, value information, and of course, you can also download it. 
the next slide, please. On top of this, we uh, we provide the map, inf the information uh, in a map, and you also have here this slider um, and the ability to com to compare concentrations with the past. Um, uh, and in our case, it's starting as of October 2020 uh, with information again on all these daily average um, uh, pollutants. Um, I think this is my last slide. Um, of course, um, if you have more information on CAMS and if um, you want to use it for a certain challenge or, or, or to develop some additional in, um, uh, indicators, you're more than welcome to contact me or to, to contact other colleagues. And um, yes, so this is, this is my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Stein. This was really, really nice. Uh, very good to see uh, all these um, products being uh, being showcased on RACE. Uh, we're staying in uh, the area of environmental indicators, so we will now uh, have a presentation from our colleague, Maria Len, uh, about water quality. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Can you see? Okay. Uh, you see it in uh, presentation mode uh, on the right way? <laughs> yes, yes, it's the right way. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So, thank you, Anka. I will now present the work uh, that has been done to uh, monitor water quality uh, during. Uh, uh, the race uh, experiment and uh, first I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, contributors for this work so the team from the GNR uh, who, who did work on, on, uh, on the calculation and the production and the analysis of the, of the indicators. So as uh, most uh, of you uh, know uh, so during the lockdown, uh, there has been a, a lot of nice images on the social media and the newspapers uh, showing uh, uh, incredibly clean waters uh, all over the, the world uh, in coastal areas. And, uh, and actually, uh, these uh, restrictions uh, the, the, um, that were put in place uh, during the COVID represented a, a unique experiment to um, uh, of uh, reduction of anthropic forcing on the environment, on the environment as we have uh, seen now with uh, the, the atmosphere, my atmosphere colleagues, um, and including, all, in, in fact, also the, the, the water in the marine coastal system, in particular the places where there is usually a significant pollution inputs uh, coming directly from the, the urban and the industrial agglomeration through so, uh, rivers. Uh, so it was natural to 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 to, to ask, and a lot of um, people actually were asking themselves if this water quality was improving because of the, the COVID restrictions and the, the decrease in pollution. And uh, of course, we also uh, wanted to check if this reduction could be uh, detected from space. And actually, uh, this is this was. Uh, feasible because uh, we have uh, historically um, we are using historically uh, optical measurements on board uh, satellite uh, data uh, to 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 calculate to estimate proxies of uh, water quality and uh, uh, in particular uh, we usually uh, use uh, chlorophyll a and tantalum suspended matter that can be derived from uh, so in particular in what i will be showing uh, this slide from the uh, old she sensor on board Sentinel 3 and the MSI sensor on board Sentinel 2. Uh, so, the, the, the chlorophyll A concentration is an indicator of algae abundance. So, to, to, to be quick on, on this, that uh, fluctuates both naturally, so there is a really a strong uh, uh, natural variability of uh, chlorophyll A concentration in uh, coastal waters due to the combined effect of. Uh, uh, winds, uh, marine currents, upwelling uh, uh, dynamics, and so on. But also in coastal area, this concentration can be strongly influenced by uh, river inputs and human activities, as a high uh, concentration can uh, result from a discharge 
in the coastal areas of urban sewage, uh, fertilizer, nutrients from uh, agriculture activities. So this is uh, routinely used as a proxy for water quality. And another proxy which is uh, commonly used is uh, total suspended matter, which is a concentration of organic and inorganic material suspended in, in the water. And uh, again, this is a proxy uh, as different of water quality as different contaminants and nutrients, uh, pesticides, metals can aggregate to this uh, suspended uh, material. And uh, if in excess in the environment, they can alter the state of, of aquatic ecosystems. So this is uh, naturally the two main uh, parameters that uh, we have been working on to um, monitor and to check the impact of the, the COVID on water quality. And um, uh, so these uh, indicators, uh, I will uh, explain in the later slides how we calculated them. But here you can see uh, on the RAVE dashboard, uh, what has been done is to uh, develop both um, maps, regional maps, and a time series of uh, two uh, specific indicators based on chlorophyll and total suspended matter uh, in uh, three different areas of interest uh, in the Mediterranean Sea that you can see uh, here. So in the North Atlantic Sea, offshore the, the Venice Laguna, at the, in the area uh, at the mouth of the Rhone River in France, and uh, offshore Barcelona at the mouth of the Ebra uh, River in Spain. We also provide um, a more uh, regional maps of those uh, parameters, uh, but this uh, that comes from the, the Copernicus Marine Service, and this will be presented in the next talk by Victor Brown. So for each uh, of these two indicators, we provide uh, regional maps and time series, and also a story uh, in the sense that uh, we have performed some uh, analysis and try to understand the variability uh, that uh, we see, uh, that we have seen during the during the lockdown and in the last uh, two years. So, how are these uh, uh, indicators calculated? So, we are using the the old she again from Sentinel three full resolution data, um, and uh, apply some uh, reg some algorithm, regional algorithm for the Mediterranean Sea to retrieve uh, phytoplankton chlorophyll and total suspended matter. Uh, using different treatments for, for the different uh, water cases, open or coastal. Um, and then the OLCHI daily time series is turned into a, a weekly time series by averaging on a pixel by pixel basis, and also averaging of a three uh, pixel per three pixels, so that at the end we have a one kilometer resolution a weekly maps. And we calculated the climatology from this using this weekly data from 2016 to 2019 to have a, a, an understanding of uh, the, the, the regular, the climatological value of, of, of these parameters, uh, which were then used as a reference for the analysis. So then uh, water quality indicators were calculated as an anomaly, uh, weekly anomalies of these two parameters. Uh, with respect to this uh, long-term climatology covering uh, the four years from 2016 and 2018. So here you can see a map of anomaly uh, in the northern Adriatic Sea area. So uh, when it's blue, it's a very um, low chlorophyll concentration anomaly, so uh, as a proxy for the uh, good water quality. And the orange is a, a, a high anomaly of, uh, of uh, chlorophyll uh, concentration. And for a specific uh, points in the area, uh, then we display on the dashboard uh, a time series of those anomalies with a, a color code, where so this is displayed for the entire year of 2020. And you have the lockdown um, time periods uh, indicated in, in pink on the, on the time series. Um, and so the color we present uh, each, for each week, uh, if we have a, a normal value of uh, chlorophyll concentration, uh, in blue, uh, low values in green, or high value uh, in, in red. So this helps monitor the, the water quality uh, for, for a long time period and, and for the specific area of interest. So what was uh, quite interesting uh, to, to, to observe during the Italian uh, lockdown, so here are some maps in March uh, 
uh, April, and this was uh, the case until uh, the end of the, the lockdown in, in May, is that uh, we could see on, on the North Adriatic, so the, the western part of the, of the North Adriatic, and here you have the city of Venice and the Laguna of Venice, a very um, a negative anomaly of the chlorophylla concentration, so the proxy for a particular, particularly uh, good water quality over this uh, over this time period. And you can see here the time series for the specific point, uh, again, uh, uh, with a uh, concentration of uh, green uh, dots. So uh, obviously the question here was, okay, is that uh, which, what is the story that we can tell? Is that uh, due to the lockdown or is there some uh, other, uh, uh, other processes that uh, enter into play? As, as I have I've said before, chlorophyll concentration can also vary uh, due to natural uh, processes. Uh, so uh, the team uh, did an exhaustive analysis going in depth and uh, taking into account many different uh, uh, other environmental parameters to check uh, this hypothesis. Uh, and uh, what, um, so I, I would do it very quickly, but uh, it was a very interesting investigation. And what was, uh, what came out is that uh, actually in the Venice uh, Laguna, uh, the pattern of low chlorophyll concentration uh, during the lockdown period was most probably linked to the decrease of uh, maritime uh, uh, traffic. This was uh, highlighted uh, using high resolution uh, Sentinel-2 images uh, that, that were available during this, uh, this period. So this is uh, an example, for instance, of turbidity value. And uh, it's uh, uh, when where you have the, the, the blue value, you have a low turbid water, so higher water quality. And on, on so on the, the, the right um, two last right uh, plots on, on, on this uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, the channel that links uh, the, the Venice Airport uh, at the north of the uh, of the plot to the, the Venice city at the south of the plot um, was particularly clean during the the lockdown with respect to pre-COVID uh, condition. Uh, so this uh, in the Venice Laguna, uh, in particular, uh, to be uh, highlighted uh, thanks to the Sentinel-2 uh, images. But when you go offshore, uh, the analysis that was performed could um, could uh, show that uh, things are getting uh, uh, more uh, complex, and that uh, the natural variability and the uh, or the, the main uh, uh, explanator or the main um, uh, factor for explaining the, the, this anomaly in chlorophyll concentration. So the, the team in particular uh, could um, uh, investigate it and find out that this striking negative trend in chlorophyll concentration was likely due to a very particular uh, interplay during this period between uh, different phenomena. And actually there was a, a particularly low winds and an increase in uh, sea surface temperature. So the, the waters offshore, the, the, uh, the North Adriatic, Adriatic Sea was particularly uh, stratified uh, during this uh, period. So, the, so the, with a, uh, an absence of upwelling of uh, nutrients, uh, which means that uh, this, le this led to uh, an anomaly of chlorophyll A concentration uh, uh, due to this um, low uh, nutrient inputs, which was also um, strengthened by the fact that um, you can see it on the left uh, during this period there was a particularly uh, low water discharge from the Po river which is uh, in, in the area and a particularly low uh, uh, turbidity value of, uh, of the Po river which was linked also to this low uh, water discharge so uh, all this uh, analysis uh, is uh, be, has been um, uh, described with uh, uh, highlighted in a paper which is uh, which is in, in submission now. Um, in this paper, a very interesting uh, approach, also very strong study, was to say, okay, so at the first order, it is clear that this anomaly that we can see uh, in uh, this water quality parameters are due to uh, environmental factor. But applying uh, even more uh, in-depth analysis with sophisticated uh, uh, analysis tool, uh, they could 
uh, highlight or put in evidence uh, the potential, the possibility that there is a second order uh, effect that could be done, that could be due uh, uh, indeed to, to, to this specific situation of the year 2020 and the, and the COVID lockdown. And so, um, using a multi-year hierarchical cluster analysis, so, so whether the reflectance of the optical sensor on Sentinel-2 is uh, classified uh, and the, the, the similarity between the spectra are uh, analyzed, uh, they could uh, show that there is a, a specific uh, a cluster of, uh, of a spectral shape that uh, could be recognized during uh, the, the summer, the, during uh, uh, 2020 uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the lockdown. And this is also explained in, uh, in this paper. So to conclude, uh, of course, this, uh, I invite you to, to, to read this paper to have uh, more information on it. I have been very quick on that. But uh, as a conclusion, I just uh, to say that uh, uh, in the frame of the race project, so we have been uh, developing uh, uh, water quality indicators based on uh, well-known proxies of water quality as chlorophyllic concentration and total suspended matter from uh, Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-2. Uh, these indicator maps and time series are operationally displayed on the dashboard on a weekly basis for three areas of interest in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the team has been working on uh, uh, understanding uh, uh, the, 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 the main factor behind the observed uh, reduction in uh, chlorophyllic concentration that could be observed uh, from those uh, data during the, the, the lockdown. And it was shown that during uh, that the, the dynamic coastal environment, uh, in those dynamic coastal environment, the, this satellite product uh, were capturing mainly the first order variability due to uh, oceanographic conditions and winds. Uh, and in uh, under particular environmental condition, we, we could uh, also uh, capture a second order signal. Uh, but, uh, of course, to, to further disentangle between uh, the, the anthrop anthropogenic and the natural variability, uh, further analysis uh, are needed uh, using ancillary data, in situ information on anthropogenic pressure and, and stressors. So, uh, there are still some work going on uh, where to, to, to add other area of interest in, in the dashboard uh, of a coastal uh, European co European coasts, and also to work on uh, um, other indicators, in particular uh, on uh, the sea surface temperature anomaly indicators, and again uh, continuing continuing the analysis to 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 better understand the changes in, in the satellite uh, product that we observed uh, and disentangling between uh, ocean environmental uh, causes and anthropogenic causes and also investigating and exploring the, the potential of, of other methodologies uh, as uh, artificial intelligence to uh, uh, integrate different uh, variables as a uh, sea surface temperature, winds, river discharge, uh, as we have seen that they all have a strong impact on water quality in order to predict uh, a better uh, water quality uh, uh, of the coastal areas. And, uh, with that, uh, I will thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Marielle. And we're running a bit over time. Uh, so um, I invite uh, immediately um, Vittorio Brand, our, our next presenter, uh, to the stage. And while Vittorio is loading his um, slides, I'd just like to, to stress that I think it was obvious from Marielle's presentation that it's very important to really understand the data, data that you're working with. So if uh, we have participants in the challenges with us here today, um, that's an invitation to send us uh, your questions and just get in touch with us if you, if you have um, troubles understanding the data. So Vittorio, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, um, uh... Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to present the, some information on the on the Copernicus Marine Service and his in, and his inputs to the race dash, uh, dashboard. So, as a background, I wanted to share to explain for the more of you that can, you're not aware what does the Ocean Power Automatic Assembly Center within uh, uh, Siemens. 
what uh, we do is that we uh, bridge the gap between space agencies and uh, the public by providing high quality products for the global ocean and European original seas based on multiple ocean color mission. The main aim is to provide as many es essential ocean color variables as possible. Those are that they obviously uh, possible to produce by, from ocean color radiometry. And so in particular, we produce um, chlorophyll in inherent optical properties, phytoplankton functional uh, groups in the fluid structure. The important point to make is that the regional products provide higher accuracy than standard global product, as there is a re regionalization of the chains that uh, takes in account the bioptical characteristics of each of the regional seas. <clears throat> This is an overview of all the products that are currently in the, in the Siemens catalog that are based on ocean color. An important point to make is that we have three series of data stream, one based on the merging of several sensors or multi-sensor products and one kilometer resolutions for the regional seas. Then the Sentinel-3 Olchi uh, A plus B uh, products at 300 meters for the regional seas. And also the Sentinel-2 uh, MSI products A and B and ATM meters. What we produce, we produce a level three daily product, a level four daily gap field and monthly average on a real time and a real process time series. And this one gives you an overview of all the products that are existing as of today or in the catalog. The, as an example for the uh, one kilometer and the 300 meter production, the point I want to make here is that um, the regional products that are produced using regional algorithms to improve their quality and hence each of the different seas has its own uh, processing chain that, make, that makes use of the local in-situ data for uh, product definition and calibration and uh, validation. And hence that's the reason why they receive different scientific publications are on the basis of the selection of the most updated algorithms. Um, that's another uh, recent addition to the catalog is the Sentinel-2 based 100 meter resolution products where remote sensing reflectance, turbidity, to spend a particular matter and chlorophyll uh, concentration are produced. Differently from the 300 meter one kilometer uh, products, the chlorophyll algorithm here is produced with only one algorithm for all the European waters. This is an example of a given day of the level four daily get field, get field. So you see that are, these are the strips of the Sentinel-2 passages for a given day. And this is they said, the one, the 100 meter with a 20 meter kilometer uh, coastal stripe. And when you have a lot of island, like in this case, or in this case, the strip of available data becomes larger. Um, so uh, moving, moving to the the input of uh, CMEMS data in the race dashboard. This is, this is the, what is being shown already earlier by Mary Len. So the Mary's, uh, sorry, the old 300 meter products are used uh, to, uh, for the production of the, uh, of the weekly climatology, of the comparison of the, with the weekly climatology. And so the, yes, for the assessment of the uh, anomalies and this is done for uh, the Venice site with his own uh, the, the, the relative uh, total suspended matter and chlorophyll uh, water quality regional maps and anomalies. The same applies for the Barcelona, Barcelona time series, and uh, in this point is the example of the time series and the uh, chlorophyll concentration, and uh, also uh, the third site, so the 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 Rome and the Marseille water, the water for the time series. The other important point to make is that also we have the multi-sensor one kilometer data, which is uh, um, we use in here the level, uh, the daily gap field data, uh, which is then um, um, uploaded to the race dashboard and to provide a background of all the coverage for the daily for the daily fields. We could also add further than the multi-sensor one kilometer data, also the uh, the daily level four for the Sentinel-2 in the next future, because that would and also that would show the, the higher resolution data. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Vittorio, for this uh, great presentation. I now welcome the, the next speaker. 
So Patrick, I think you take over from here. Thanks, Anka. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick Griffiths. Um, you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. So thank you, Anka. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present a little bit of information on the race challenges um, in the context of the race initiative. So um, the race challenges that we have been organizing um, for the last one and a half years are basically our effort to invite the community to participate in the investigations that we're doing using Earth observation and other geospatial data sources to um, investigate the impact of the pandemic on the environment and socioeconomic systems. So the idea is basically, you know, in the community, there might be some good thinking and we want to invite the community to, to develop these ideas and contribute to the race dashboard. And the first round of challenges was held in 2020. Um, back then, this was linked to the um, uh, Sentinel Hub uh, eval script um, uh, interface. And uh, this uh, first phase of challenges um, was basically, you know, submissions were evaluated on a weekly basis. And we had weekly winners with no real predefined theme, so it was very open. And uh, we then uh, initiated a second round of challenges in 2021 using the Eurodata Cube um, uh, Jupyter Lab environment as the interactive development environment. And we had uh, several defined themes for the initial challenges that were on a monthly basis in March and April. And the latest call for challenges and for participation um, is open for three months and has four uh, it has uh, four themes, defined themes. So here's a little um, a summary of what we did in the 2020 custom script challenges, where we had these weekly submissions and uh, there were a couple of good ideas there. And, um, you know, so there were some on water quality uh, of rivers, some on vessel dynamics, some on uh, construction monitoring using synthetic aperture radar, and then of course our famous examples of the truck detection and also the flying airplane monitoring. For the next new round of challenges, we switched basically to the Eurodata Cube environment where you have Jupyter notebooks available and you can access all of the um, data sets um, relevant to the race dashboard and also the existing indicators and um, other data sets and uh, with the team from Eurodata Cube, we created some nice um, tutorial notebooks where we also provide the links on a later slide, also with help from our engineering support teams. And these are really helpful resources um, for you to understand how you can use the uh, many tools that Eurodata Cube offers to access data sets, to visualize um, certain indicators, how to retrieve, you know, um, COVID statistics to bring them into your multidisciplinary analysis and investigation. So the common goal for all the challenges <clears throat> is basically to identify innovative and new and relevant ideas um, and support, uh, support these investigations basically for geographic and temporal upscaling. And um, <clears throat> then basically the good ideas should really transition into um, new race dashboard indicators. And we have some presentations on, on some of these indicators today. So on the left hand side, the example that Henrik Fisser is going to present on the truck detection. On the right hand side, the team from Mauricio Pamplona, who's going to present this after a little bit after this talk on the flying airplane detection. And then finally, in the middle, this is the um, ongoing investigation from Alessandro Cimbelli, um, who's trying to characterize the um, vessel dynamics in front of major ports. Um, over time. So we'll have presentations in all of these three. And yes, so to transition these initial ideas into um, race dashboard indicators, we have set up this um, kind of roadmap where for the current challenge, uh, participants basically have three months to develop their initial ideas using Jupyter Notebooks and Eurodata Cube, the licenses that we provide for that. And we basically offer here monetary prizes for the best ideas. Uh, 5,000 euro for the overall best contribution, 
3,000 euros for the second best and 1,000 euro for additionally selected ideas during the first three month phase. And then these selected ideas are basically invited to contribute um, or basically to work on EU level upscaling of their ideas where we provide also engineering support and enhanced um, license packages for the Eurodata Cube environment. And here we offer up to 10,000 euros for the best contribution that then needs to be upscaled to a relevant European level um, spatial extent and relevant temporal extent. And then finally, we would then invite those um, upscaled contributions again to um, transform their upscaled analysis into a formal race dashboard indicator. And there we offer another 5,000 euros for each, um, for each um, incorporated indicator. So altogether, you know, this is quite an attractive um, reward, um, summing up to 20,000 euros if you, if you do well. And um, for the current challenge, we have three themes that are defined. That's uh, transport and pollution, socioeconomic impacts, uh, econ economic recovery of the pandemic, and also an open theme. So if you have additional ideas that you wanna work on, that's fine too. And this current challenge period is open from 1st of September until the 30th of November. And we have the links here and also on the later pages. So the uh, themes that we have defined, just two examples here, the transport and pollution, um, which is quite openly defined. And it's basically looking at the, um, the, in, the relationship between changing transport patterns in, um, in shipping vessels or also with uh, trucks or um, road transport and pollution, um, environmental pollution that you observe using earth observation data sources such as Sentinel-5P uh, for the atmospheric parameters, or also the nice CMEMS data sets that were highlighted from in the previous presentation. So the idea is, you know, how can we demonstrate this link between uh, changing transport patterns and the uh, uh, resulting pollution patterns? And um, we had a key we presented some ideas on how this could be approached, but it's really quite open to the participants to lay this out as they want. And the second theme is um, looking at socioeconomic impacts, which is traditionally a hard um, uh, theme to approach with Earth observation data, but um, there are some, some good ideas on this and uh, we provide some example questions here, how you can approach this and um, you know, using different small proxies um, to then define a more complex indicator is one idea how you could do this. But basically here we want to see, you know, to what extent varying phases of the pandemic affected socioeconomic patterns across Europe. For all of the challenges, the evaluation basically follows these um, set of criteria. So what's the innovation potential? Is there cross-disciplinary value? Because that's, of course, what we're kind of targeting here because the race dashboard brings together all of these interdisciplinary data sets and some, um, some easily implementable analytic methods. What's the scientific integrity and is validation considered? What's the upscaling potential of this idea? Some ideas cannot be upscaled. And is there a joint use of earth observation and other data sets? And also, is there a relevance for European policies? Okay, we have offer a whole range of um, technical support elements here. Um, the most important is the technical guide that um, Anka and colleagues have developed here, which is really rich and valuable information for any participant, uh, showing you, for example, how to access um, existing indicators, um, data sets, how to create custom dashboards, um, where to find the tutorial notebooks, and uh, the link for accessing that is here. Um, the challenge uh, rules and resources I explained here, and um, there are also uh, our support email addresses here. And uh, just an additional point here, we're happy to organize a Q&A. If there's an interest, just drop us an email. Okay, and with that, I would... Um, um, invite the next speaker to follow up here. We have uh, now um, four additional presentations that will uh, look at different aspects of the race challenges. 
we will start with Stefan Meisel from EOX. We'll describe a little bit the uh, EOX workspace for the challenges, and then we'll have Henrik Fisser, Mauricio Pamplona, and Alessandro Cimbelli demonstrating these community contributed um, indicators that they have been developing. I'll hand over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Excellent. Okay. So, yeah, thank you for all the introduction. I, I want to use my 10 minutes to give you a overview of the resources that we provide for you as a participant. And I not only want to do this uh, with the boring slide sets, but uh, I try to do a, a real life demonstration. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> um, so, for the uh, registration step to, uh, to register to participate at the uh, contest, go to this link. Uh, don't worry, it will be shared afterwards as well. So I recorded this registration step, which I obviously did uh, before the, the session. But uh, you, you use that link, you just register for an account. So you provide your usual things and email address that's important so to, be, to stay in contact with you. You can also use other uh, authentication methods, so like the, the COI, for example. Um, and here you register, now you have an account at your data cube, and then you just, okay, we want the country, your country for statistical purposes, but that's really the only information. Uh, so, yep, you accept, the, of course, the, the terms as usual and then you click the participate link and with this we get the information that you want to participate and we will provision the workspace for you including all the services that uh, we provide and i will show them in a second so it's uh, important it's no need for you that to, to do to anything from now on you will receive an email once this is done we will provision that for you um okay but with this now let's go to the uh the live demonstration. So um, now, as I said, you will get notifications that uh, your services are subscribed. So once you enter your data cube dashboard, that's how it will look like for you as a participant. So you will you will see uh, just a second. Excuse me. <laughs> that's a, the joy of working home. <laughs> Okay, so you will see here the, the services that you get, the set and up subscription, GDP subscription, and of course the, the workspace, the UX Hub promotion workspace. Sorry. Okay. So in this uh, workspace, the most important thing, of course, is the Jupyter Lab, as Patrick already said earlier. So um, I have this open here already. Uh, okay, I had it opened too early. So again, you, that's how it looks like. So it's starting. And what we provide you in this uh, Jupyter Lab environment is that you want this here, right? So you have down here, you have the UX Hub ties, the your data cube ties, and we get the race, the readme for the race challenges. So again, it's a textured description of the challenges in, in general. But what Patrick already mentioned, most importantly is the Jupyter notebooks that we provide here. So tutorials on the various services that are available and how to access the data, the indicator data that are provided for the challenges or in general for the dashboard. So let's start with the first one, you select it. So in this case, it's just uh, rendered. You can uh, read through it if you want to, but of course you can always execute it interactively. So you need to copy it in your workspace. And um, once you have it in your workspace, you can really run through the notebook and execute it interactively. Ah, excellent. Uh, okay. So here you see the list of uh, indicators that we that we have available. And for the demonstration, I've chosen the same indicator that marie Helene uh, presented. So it's the water quality time series. We call it N3. Um, so well, you can, can connect to the GDB in this case. 
So I'm showing the, the TUDB access for the vector data, obviously. So you see we have this uh, indicator at the three locations here. And then you can, of course, always retrieve the data and plot it. And now I hope that this, this fun is uh, recovered. Yes, temporary hiccups. I'm sorry for that. So I run through it in order to be able to plot it now. So I'm really, we are downloading now the data from GDB and we plot it for one city. And in this case, I believe we selected Barcelona, right? But what you can do as well, I mean, you see here that the data now, and you can use the data for whatever uh, integration you want to come up with. But what we can also do is, of course, we can add interactivity already in the notebook here. So in this case, we simply make the, the city selectable. So we can, for example, go to Venice, the Venice Lagoon, and see, see the indicator there. Um, yep, so this is uh, what I wanted to show for the GUDB. But let's go to, to other notebooks, and I have them already opened here. So for example, we have the second note that I wanted to show is the process API, um, where you can get access to all the raster data and also the data sets that are used in the, in the various indicators. Just note that they are on different infrastructure, so you have to use the right collection ID. Okay, so we, we have here prepared a uh, population density data that is used in, in, in various indicators. So we just uh, retrieve the population density of one country, which is Austria in this case. But you have always, of course, the full, as Craig uh, explained in his presentation, the full list of data sets like the Sentinel-2 and, uh, and others. So here we make a simple request for Sentinel level 1C and level 2A data. And we can also have uh, Sentinel-3 data. Uh, yeah. And uh, various output formats. So there's a lot of flexibility in the process API that I invite you to explore. I'm not sure how I'm doing in time. Maybe I show quickly because I, I really like it. But then I leave the rest to, to you to explore the statistics API that also Greg already mentioned. Um, and here, as you can see, we connect to the data that is on different instances of Sentinel Hub. And we, so also data that was using the bring your own data, data uh, functionality for the dashboard. So in this case, uh, we are connecting a Sentinel 1, Sentinel 2, and 3 again. And we are retrieving the data over this area of interest that was shown. And now we are plotting it. And in this case, it's aggregated over time. So you see on the x-axis the time, and you see this uh, different uh, data over time aggregated. But, and this is now maybe more interesting, we have lots of data that is uh, specific for the indicators, like uh, temperature or uh, humidity and wind. And again, we just show a quick example how to retrieve the data, oops, and show it over time. Again, the various, the thing, uh, the various uh, layers. But of course, you not only get the aggregation and the mean, but you get standard deviation and other statistical parameters, as you can see in this graph. Okay, let me let me stop with the, maybe just one quick mentioning of the X cube. So you can also have the, the X cube and X cube can service and connect to those to to have real data cubes and uh, in X array in Python. Um, well. And the last thing I wanted to quickly show, once you are done with your new indicator and you have a submission that you want to do, so you please place everything in one folder, like I did here with some sample files. You can use uh, Python uh, notebook files or just markdown files to, uh, to have a textual description of your indicator. And once you're done, just right click on the folder and then you find here in a menu entry, which says submit directory for race challenge three. And when you click this, then you confirm and that's your submission. You can always redo the submission. So we will get this uh, in the point of time, we will copy the, the, the whole directory and you can always, of course, redo undo until the end of the challenge.
well, that would be my quick introduction to the resources that you can use as a participant. And I invite you to participate in the challenge and I'm looking forward to, to see the lot of submissions. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Stefan. I think we have to move up and we're, we're a little bit late in time here. I think we have to move to the uh, next presenter, which uh, who is, um, I believe, uh, Henrik Fisser. <clears throat> but certainly a very nice um, uh, results submission interface that you have created there and a lot of great resources really invite everyone to take a look there. Henrik, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Uh, very happy to be here today at um, the side event about the race dashboard at the EOP week. Um, I'm going to present about the track detection indicator based on Sentinel-2 that I contributed to the race dashboard last year. So my name is Henrik Kisser. I have um, graduated from the University of Würzburg this year, and this uh, work has, has been done in the framework of um, my master's program. We're looking at the indicator um, about the number of tracks in the um, race dashboard, um, which you see here. Um, and tracks uh, in general are really, uh, it could be called the heartbeat of um, the economy, because, um, for instance, in the European Union, 75% uh, of the inland freight is actually transported on roads. Um, now, this is also why uh, countries use that as an economic indicator in near real time. So this is a track toll mileage index from Germany. And um, here on the left in April uh, 2020, um, May 2020, um, we see that drop um, that is uh, clearly associated to the first lockdown during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, initially, uh, two years ago, potentially, if uh, someone had asked me if we could detect trucks and create some kind of indicator uh, similar to a truck uh, a mileage index, maybe not as close, but um, just in general, um, I would have said, yeah, maybe you can do that with a very high resolution data. But um, I've shown last year with my idea, which I contributed to the um, contest, that we are actually able to see and also to detect uh, moving trucks in um, in Sentinel-2 data, which is because of a sensor effects, effect, the multispectral instrument that's the sensor of the Sentinel-2 satellite. It has an interband parallax effect causing a temporary sensing offset between these bands. And here on the left, we see that this um, is up to um, half a second, for instance, between bands two and band three, and another half a second between band three and band five. And that's how we are getting um, these kind of reflectance signatures that we see here on the right. Um, so these sand rainbows on roads. Essentially, what we see there is a truck moving. Okay, it could also be a, an object of similar size, for instance, a bus, but that at uh, the stage of developing this, um, this has been the, the uh, assumption and it has been validate, validated since then as well. Now, the initial method uh, contributed to the race dashboard relies really on only a, a small part or a third of uh, the truck in the RGB spectrum, and that's the blue part, um, exploiting this outstanding um, or this, this remarkable reflectance there um, as uh, the blue reflectance is superior compared to the green and the red uh, reflectance. And the very simple um, um, method uh, uses two ratios between the blue and the red and the blue and the green, um, and then targets these trucks, assigns a point, and then uh, and filters uh, surrounding points in the direct neighborhood and obviously be sure that only one uh, single point location is associated with the truck detection. We, um, have some, yeah, some detection examples across Europe uh, presented here on the right. For the race dashboard, there has been an initial validation using traffic count station data in Germany, and we depicted here in red the number of cars counted by the station, in dark green the number of trucks counted by the station, and in light green the number of trucks counted by the Sentinel-2 method on one acquisition of the Eighth of May 2018, um, and we, we see that the magnitude of trucks here is is correct compared to the cars. So this already confirms that we're actually not detecting um, trucks, uh, cars, but trucks. Um, that's a clear sign for that. Um, I would say that after some more validation approaches, also during uh, my master's thesis, that the figures here below 
are the um, rather correct um, depiction. So it's uh, usually an underestimation of, of a third or even half um, compared to the station data, but that varies um, on the top on the top figures you see that can be better as well. For the rate dashboards, I have created an indicator comparing a baseline which um, comprises the years 2017, 18, 19, and then always the period between the 1st of April and the 21st of June, and then comparing that to the COVID year 2020. Only Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays were considered to exclude, exclude those um, days with, with the lower truck traffic, which uh, are the weekend, weekend days and the surrounding days, Monday and Friday. So I would like to uh, give you, uh, yeah, walk you briefly through um, the indicators. Here you see um, the race dashboard, which uh, you might already know, already know, and we click on the number of trucks. Um, and here we have um, the, yeah, the opportunity to look at motorways and primary roads. See here um, the detections in that period depicted in 10 by 10 kilometer cells. Um, so four periods, the three baseline periods, and then at 2020, you have um, some information here on the right, and we can zoom in and actually um, explore that in, in a very customized way, selecting an area of interest here, looking at the Rotterdam port and the surrounding and uh, motorways. We recognize that um, the baseline years all had more trucks detected um, than the 2020 year, and um, also yeah, draw a customized, even more customized AOI, multi polygon, and um, yeah, have a look what's there near the port of Calais, the connection basically between Belgium, the port of Calais, um, and there, there as well, we actually uh, recognize that there has been a decline. It's not as clear as, uh, as, as here in all areas. If you explore, you will see that um, in some areas, it, there was even a rise uh, of, of uh, trucks detected in the period in 2020 and um, other areas. It's just uh, stagnating. So it's really diverse, diverse across Europe. And of course, um, we must also keep in mind that there might have been some catch up effects already. Here, for instance, um, 2019 is higher, but the other years, there's no clear pattern, neither an increase nor a de decrease. We then zoom in, we can also actually explore the real detections. So here for 2020, we see the point locations of the detection and truck de trucks detected in the Sentinel-2 data in that period. Yeah, and we can compare that as well with other periods, uh, 2017, 18, 19. Um, for primary roads as well, we can just uh, do a similar process and have a look at our customized AOIs. Here, for instance, there's um, Paris, looking at the primary road indicator for Paris. Actually, really quickly, the graph is appearing, and we, we see that, well, here again, um, we see a decline uh, of tracks. But there are other areas where it looks completely different. Um, let's compare that to the beautiful city of Rome. Um, how does that look? And here, appearing soon. Yeah, it's not not as clear. You might see some differences, but um, worth to explore more. And of course, you can just um, visit the race dashboard and along with uh, many other uh, fascinating indicators. Um, um, you're you're much welcome uh, to explore this and also to um, ask questions and and uh, share your results of your. Uh, own explorations, maybe in your own country or area of interest. Um, so, all, uh, as I said, uh, the, the picture is quite diverse. Here it's depicted, um, aggregated on the whole country, whether there had, had been a, has been an increase, a non situational decrease of counter trucks and motorways, and recognize that um, actually 58% uh, of the countries. Uh, show decrease, while um, yeah, 29% uh, of the countries even an increase, even uh, more than 20% in Spain and uh, Germany, for instance, uh, stayed nearly uh, stable. 
um, and that might also be um, related to some catch-up effects that uh, were already captured in the 2020 period. I want to hint to last thing. So uh, detecting trucks with uh, Sentinel-2 data, it has been uh, something new. Others um, have exploited that effect already for airplanes, for cloud detection, um, but also for, for ship detection, for calculating also velocities. And I've been um, yeah, pursuing that method or that promising um, idea in, in my master's thesis and also developed the next version, let's say, um, of the truck detection method and then being actually a, 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 a real object detection method delineating the whole truck object and also calculating the heading, the speed, and that has been extensively validated um, on a global basis using labeled data and then on a um, local basis across the country of Germany using 26 um, um, station sta traffic count stations. Um, here we see um, that there's quite a good fit between that station and the Sentinel-2 counts. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to thank everyone who has um, yeah, shown interest and supported this. Thanks a lot, Henrik. Fascinating results and great that this is still ongoing as a scientific investigation. Also, for anyone um, to know maybe that Henrik's idea, which started as a little prototype script in uh, Sentinel Hub, that it has now transitioned to an on-demand algorithm that can be consumed by anyone in EuroDataCube. And we're planning to reprocess um, entire Euro European coverages of the truck detection for uh, the uh, last years and for 2021 as well. So that's really a great evolution of the product. So we'll move on to the next presenter, which is Mauricio Pomplona. Uh, welcome for joining us and thanks for joining us so early. I assume you're still in the US. So uh, Mauricio will uh, present his community contribution to the race dashboard. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. So uh, my name is Mauricio and uh, I'm going to present our indicator, which is the indicator about flying airplanes. Uh, this was a collaboration in between uh, four universities, USF here in the US, and then UT, FPR, and UNICAM from Brazil, and NTNU uh, from Norway. Uh, and well, uh, the, 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 base, the base of our uh, indicator is similar to the previous indicator that you just saw. So uh, we originally intended to detect uh, parked airplanes, and by looking into air airport images, uh, on the EO browser, we noticed that we could actually see uh, the moving airplanes uh, as this RGB uh, pattern. Uh, and then we actually moved uh, our idea to uh, detecting flying airplanes because this would give us like, a better idea on uh, the impact of the COVID-19 uh, into the traffic of airplanes. Because even though like uh, uh, we, we had some impact in the number of flights, sometimes the number of parked airplanes did not show uh, a big change. Uh, and yeah, the, basically the same effect that we you saw for trucks uh, is what happens in, in airplanes, but we have actually a second cause. So airplanes actually are, are, are high above the ground. They are not necessarily on the ground, uh, only when they are taking uh, uh, they, uh, they, they are parting, parting from the airport or, 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 or arriving. Uh, so we have these two causes in here. The first one is actually movement from the satellite. Since we have a small uh, time lapse in between the color bands during the acquisition, uh, uh, the satellite actually sees the airplane from different locations in each of the bands. But we also have one object that is traveling at high speed. So if we consider that like the three bands were uh, captured uh, with certain delay, but that satellite wasn't moving, uh, we would still have like some uh, displacement uh, in the object in the ground caused by the speed of the uh, airplane. And that's why we can actually see the, 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 the aircraft in the runways because they are not high uh, in the air. Uh, so this effort, effort in here doesn't play, the first one doesn't play a role, but the second one does, and we still have uh, the, the, the three colors uh, uh, in the airplanes. And in these images in here, you can see actually the three, uh, the two efforts together. So uh, in some cases, the, the, the airplane, they leave some tracks in there. And we can see here the direction of the airplane uh, because of the track. And we can also see uh, the direction of the satellite because of the displacement in between the tracks in each of the color bands. 
So we can see that the satellite is uh, going from up down, and we can see the, the airplane in here in, in the first example uh, is going from the left to the right. Uh, and then we created uh, a, a whole framework that would process satellite images uh, and would end up uh, with some analysis of the, uh, the traffic of, of airplanes around some airports. Uh, the first step to do that was to select some airports in Europe. Uh, to do this analysis, we got the list of the 30 um, business uh, airplanes uh, to do this analysis, and we got a, a nice coverage uh, around Europe by doing that. And we split this, uh, two, uh, this group of uh, airports in two groups, uh, training and testing, because we wanted to check if our method was going to generalize to unseen uh, regions. Then we used OpenStreetMap to define the location of each of these airports that we selected. And then we used the Sentinel Hub to download uh, a large uh, image around the airport. Because you cannot look for uh, flying airplanes only uh, in the airport region, you can see here that the airport region is only a very small piece uh, in the area that we are looking uh, for airplanes. This area has about 6,000 square kilometers uh, for each of the airports that we are uh, processing. And this area is going to give us about 20 minutes of coverage. This means that we can see airplanes that are arriving in the airport in up to 20 minutes and air, air, aircraft that departed the, 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 the airport in up to 20 minute, minutes ago. So uh, it's only a small window, but we can see a decent number of airplanes by doing that. And we can have a, a decent idea about the traffic uh, of this specific airport by getting this kind of area. Uh, and then the way we detect these airplanes is by using neural networks. So we are using one type of neural network that is called fully convolutional network. And basically this network is going to get every small patch uh, in this image. And the size of this patch is 20, uh, 51 by 51 pixels. Uh, and it's going to classify it as either uh, an airplane or background or, 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 or uh, soil in this case, like uh, it's not going to be an airplane. Uh, and this sizing here, uh, we basically computed it uh, in a way that we would cover uh, the speed of any commercial flight. So it can get uh, airplanes traveling uh, at up to 1800 uh, kilometers per hour. And this is twice as much as the average uh, commercial uh, flight speed. Uh, and well, the, the main problem with us was actually annotating the images so we could train our network. Uh, so the way we actually managed to do it was by doing uh, a semi-automatic approach. Uh, so we first got a, only a small number of images and annotated a, a few airplanes there. We trained one classifier by doing that. And then we did rounds of detection on the training images followed by manual inspection of the detection to discard the false detections. And then we would retrain the method and then do it again uh, until we got a detector that would work well uh, for the training airports. And then we would check uh, the, the performance uh, on, on, on the test uh, airports. In here, we, you can see some challenges. We can have clouds that are going to affect the detection of the airplanes. We can have some displacement between the color bands that is going to create like the same RGB pattern, but for buildings, or we can have noise uh, on ocean areas, and all of them are going to affect the result of the detection. And this is not something that we can train uh, to be robust to, because usually they are like random patterns or they are too similar to the airplane. So if we train to ignore these regions, we are not going to be able to detect the airplanes. So the way we actually solved that was by doing some post-processing. So we basically ignore all the areas that have too many clouds. We also ignore areas that have like missing data uh, and finally, we check how many airplanes we detect in each of these small uh, blocks in, in, in our entire image. And if you have too many detections in one of these blocks, we are going to delete this block as well. Uh, this is because after actually annotating some images in, using our semi-automatic uh, approach, uh, we actually saw how many airplanes we usually have in each of those blocks. Uh, and we saw that we never have, have more than five uh, airplanes in, in a single block. So if any region has more than five airplanes, we would discard it. Uh, and then we do a masked average of the, of the detections over time for all the images that we can get for an airport in, in, in one month. And we can uh, create like monthly estimates of the number 
of airplanes around this airport. And you can see that we can have, we, we end up with a curve uh, that reflects the impact of the COVID. So for each airport, we do have a, a reference number of how many air, uh, airplanes uh, we expect to detect in one image. Uh, and we can see that during the COVID, if we have high restrictions, we can see that the number of flights is much smaller. Uh, and when we have like some, uh, re uh, uh, we, we don't have so many restrictions, the, the number of flights start getting back to normal, which is this blue bars in here. We also did some uh, quantitative analysis. We saw that we have uh, less than one false alarm uh, per month per airport, which is quite good uh, with our artificial uh, uh, intelligence approach. Uh, in here, I'm showing some of the detections. You can see that it's very robust uh, to many variations in the aircraft. We have like big aircrafts, medium aircrafts, uh, very small aircrafts that we can barely see. So the images in here are magnified. Uh, we can detect airplanes in the ground and we can have occlusions because of missing data or clouds and the method still works. Uh, in here, we have some of the cases of false detections and you can see that in most cases, they are caused by noise uh, or clouds. But in some cases, we do have like some colored patterns in the ground that also cause uh, uh, misdetections, including trucks in the road sometimes. Uh, and in here, we compared our results uh, to uh, flight track records from Open Sky Network. This like is a website that has like the the the, the, the tracks from real flights, and you can see here uh, the yellow circles are our detections, and we are detecting airplanes in the same locations where we have records on open sky, which are the pink circles. Uh, uh, and you can see that we have a lot of flights before COVID and during COVID. Uh, we had a, a reduction in the, in the number of flights and our indicator is going to reflect that. Uh, we did some manual measurements to, uh, to check if it was working. And at airport level, we do have uh, some noise uh, in our measurements. But if you combine several uh, airports, uh, you can see here that our uh, estimator, uh, our indicator is very stable. This, uh, this curve is showing that we actually reconstructed the signal that was created with the real number of flights from 42 countries in, the, in Europe. Uh, the, uh, we, we got this data from Eurocontrol and we can reproduce the same behavior. We can actually measure uh, the impact of COVID like uh, very well uh, using the images from satellite uh, data. Uh, and basically as a re as result, uh, we got one award from the race competition, uh, and we also integrated uh, our solution to the race dashboard. Uh, we also they, they did a publication about our idea, and we released all the code and all the data in case you want to reuse that for other indicators or for any other uh, application that you wish. And yeah, that's my presentation for today. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mauricio. Great results. Let's move on to the final speaker because we're running heavily over time here, which is uh, Alessandro Cimbelli. Uh, Mauricio, thanks a lot. And it's very interesting. And also, I really like the way that you normalized uh, for the varying number of observations from Sentinel-2. That was really well done. So a uh, really good contribution here. Uh, Alessandro, are you ready to present? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Thanks, Patrick. Fantastic. Well, I am... Well, um, I don't know if you can see my my presentation here. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, let, um, okay. Okay. We see you. That's the first okay. step. <laughs> uh, well. Now, can you see here? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, well, I'm going to present you a study uh, about uh, um, uh, a possible yeah, uh, a possible indicator of uh, the um, uh, vessel uh, number extracted from the Sentinel-1 images that are um, in the anchorage areas of the main European uh, uh, hubs um, uh, and uh, could be seen uh, perhaps as a complement of the 
of the analysis that has been done by Florian of OX about the crude oil storage indicator. Um, so, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic in uh, spring 2020, uh, one of the main effects has been the uh, dramatic fall of oil, um, of crude oil prices, uh, as we can see here in, the, in this chart. And uh, in particular, the fourth block, all the transportation has uh, uh, had a dramatic impact even of the, uh, on the airline jet fuel. Uh, the direct consequence of that uh, has been that uh, the onshore uh, tanks uh, have remained full and uh, uh, the, the oil tankers uh, uh, has remained uh, uh, blocked and anchored off the, 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 main, uh, the main hubs, uh, waiting for uh, unload their, their load. Uh, so uh, the um, the study has been uh, as focused on this area uh, in the English Channel uh, that are in front of uh, the uh, main European hub of Rotterdam, Antwerp, and uh, and Amsterdam, uh, in particular during all the year uh, 2020. And uh, um, Sentinel One images uh, have been used to. Uh, to detect, to count uh, these, uh, these vessels uh, that are in, this, uh, in these areas. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have, uh, I have compared the number extracted from this uh, kind of processing with the uh, uh, carbon monoxide values collected by Sentinel-5P over the, the same area of interest uh, in order to understand uh, possible correlations. Um, so the approach has been to uh, extract the outer um, borders uh, of uh, each vessel from the images and convert them uh, as, uh, as an array. This has, um, has allowed to, to, um, to classify ships according to their, to their sites also. Um, results, uh, uh, the results of a correlation has shown that uh, in the first stage, has shown that uh, there is a correlation of 0.66 between a moving average of 10 days of the number of vessels during the whole year uh, with the value of uh, carbon monoxide uh, of the Sentinel 5P. Uh, so it's uh, a good starting point, in, in my opinion, to understand. This is a short animation that show the number of uh, vessel, and uh, uh, we can see that uh, um, that uh, during the, the 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 days of April and May, uh, it has uh, increased a lot uh, the number of small points uh, in in this area. Um, I, currently, I'm in the uh, upscale phase of this study, uh, so uh, I'm the the. The main objective uh, are now to extend this uh, this uh, analysis to the um, 30 around 30 uh, main European uh, anchorage areas and uh, commercial harbors, and uh, to um, the, um, extract to derive uh, some other parameters from the Sentinel One images like uh, the area and perimeter uh, as well as the width length of the vessels. But at the same time, to integrate with other services uh, that comes from uh, come from the uh, Marine Copernicus uh, that uh, uh, can uh, can um, can give information about the sea currents and the wind uh, in the position of the of each vessel. So that could be interesting to understand uh, if um, uh, even the position of the vessels. Uh, the, the, of each vessel. And uh, at the same time, um, uh, as a main uh, as a main objective, we want to I want to uh, uh, classify uh, ships uh, as in motion of, or uh, or anchored. Uh, so uh, that's it, my short presentation. Uh, so I, I hope. Uh, it's all clear.
Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Alessandro. This, this is an interesting investigation and we're really looking forward to supporting you further in the upscaling process. Okay. So thanks a lot. Thank I think we had originally foreseen a little question and answer session here, but I think um, given that we're 20 minutes over schedule, I think we will simply um, remind you that there are support email addresses and that we can organize a, a question and answer session ad hoc if, if needed. So Anka pasted the um, support email address here again into the chat. And um, I, th I thank all the presenters from the uh, challenges and I uh, hand over to Anka for some final words. Yes, just to thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. So just to echo uh, Patrick's words, um, we are really looking forward to receiving your questions and um, uh, we, we have this email address that is uh, always ready for you. You can also, um, I invite you to, to visit the GitHub, of course, and to provide us feedback there. You can also uh, open new issues and request new features for this project. So, uh, yeah, keep in touch. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.